I want you to know how exciting it is for me to see all of you here in my house. Um, when I came to Columbia in 1996, um, I hadn't understood that, you know, take off your shoes, you're standing on sacred ground, means the space at Columbia. It's so difficult to find space at Columbia. And I'm happy to have this, this uh, kind of space um, for this kind of uh, program, this particular program. The mission of the Earl Hall Center is etched in stone above the threshold of this building, erected for the students that religion and learning may go hand in hand and character grow with knowledge. I'm Janelle Davis, the university chaplain and associate provost. The Office of the University Chaplain is pleased to co-sponsor this two-day conference and to welcome you, welcome you dearly um, to the Columbia campus. And for many of you, it's, uh, it's a welcome home because some of you have come and gone from Columbia. And so we're, we're happy to have you back home. Um, this journey to this conference started for Yosef and I um, probably back in, in 2007. Um, at a conference organized by Fred Davey in Atlanta. And I've been in university chaplaincy um, all of my ministry, and so I didn't realize that some of the clergy partners that were invited to the, that event were so afraid to be there. And some of them would say, oh, my bishop better not find out I came to something like this. And, and they were so concerned and so obvious in their, their homophobia, um, and more than homophobia, their intolerance and hatred of gay, lesbian, bisexual, and transgender folks. And so when Yosef came to Columbia and I knew that he was continuing that work, it was a time when my spirit said, Amen. Um, because I wanted to find a way to stay involved and be supportive, but it wasn't, there wasn't a natural fit um, with an outside uh, not-for-profit. But, but Yosef has been an incredibly wonderful colleague, a real voice for justice here at Columbia. Um, I'd like to thank you, Yosef, for your amazing leadership in the preparation of this conference, um, where you've been both a Martha and a Mary. Um, is it going to be enough for these people to eat? And also um, concerned about the conceptual framework you have put together um, with the team at IRIS and in the center um, an amazing um, couple of days. And so thank you for being at Columbia. Thank you for inviting me to be on your board. And thank you for what you will do for all of God's children in this work. Thanks. Uh, good morning, excuse me, good morning everyone. My name is Samuel Roberts. I'm the director of the Institute for Research in African American Studies and here at Columbia, an associate professor of history and socio-medical sciences. I wanted to briefly say welcome. Um, I will keep my remarks brief as I was so instructed before we get to our wonderful panel and a wonderful conference. I would uh, again e uh, echo uh, Chaplain Davis's uh, remarks and thank uh, Yosef for what promises to be uh, not only an invigorating discussion, but one of great import for today's politics. Uh, clearly what we will see here is affirming the continuing relevance and influence of religion in daily life, but also uh, a, an attempt in a longer effort to resolve a paradox, which is uh, that there are many uh, in this country, in this world, who would use religiosity as a blunt instrument or, or a cudgel of sorts to actually um, uh, restrain uh, freedom and also to hide the liberationist implications of religion where uh, we may find it and develop it. I think this, uh, I, I was not involved in the planning of this conference. I watched from a distance uh, with great admiration how Yosef put together his team, which included, and I do this at the risk of leaving many volunteers out as well, but uh, Sean uh, Mendoza and Sharon Harris, whom you have probably seen, they might raise their hands if they may, please. <laughs> also, uh, Laura McTai, uh, is, uh, as far as I know, very much, or not as far as I know, but definitely instrumental in this. 
Um, so it's been our pleasure to contribute to this effort in any way that we can. We are very much looking forward to it. I would also like to thank all of you for coming and to welcome you to Columbia on behalf of the Institute for Research in African American Studies. Thank you very much. Good morning. Um, very quickly, um, we are live streamed, so I've been told to tell you all or remind you all to please turn off your cell phones. Most significant order of business, I would just jump to the heart of the matter. Please, if you have not already, turn off your cell phones. Um, what will be my very brief opening remarks, I just want to uh, touch on three quick things. And first is to acknowledge a long list of folks who have contributed in, in any number of ways to making this event happen. First, of course, want to uh, thank Chaplain Davis, as, as she suggested, often in New York City and at Columbia, space is the hardest thing. Uh, and as soon as the conference was announced, within two days, we had a space to hold the vast majority of our proceedings. So we thank you for the many ways you support this center's work and the hosting of this conference. Thank Sam Roberts uh, in the Institute for Research in African American Studies. Uh, while we were planning the launch for the conference, IRAS uh, every year has a major fall and spring event, and from the outset they stepped up and said, well, let us support this as part of our major fall programming as well as help you launch the center. So thank, uh, thank IRAS for the way in which the center has found a, a home for its work there and, and the many ways it continues uh, to support what we're trying to do. Uh, we have about seven or eight other co-sponsors on campus. I see many of the folks who uh, are part of that group, and so I just want to acknowledge them very quickly. Uh, first, uh, in the provost office, Andy Davidson. Uh, through the, the, the resources that are available under the diversity funds, Andy stepped up and supported us as well, so thank you to the provost office. Uh, Karen Barkey in the Institute for Religion, Culture, and Public Life. Uh, Alondra Nelson was then director of the Institute for Research, Women, Gender, and Sexuality. Patricia Daly is now director, and Alondra, of course, is our dean of social science and will be on our keynote conversation tomorrow morning. Uh, Francis Negron Montaner in the Center for the Study of Ethnicity and Race. Uh, Catherine Frankie in the Center for uh, Gender and Sexuality in the Law. Janet Jacobson and now Tina Camp at the Barnard Center for Research on Women. Uh, Fred Davey and Serene Jones, the president of Union Theological Seminary, and uh, the Students Against Mass Incarceration, known as SAMI, here at Columbia. I think the, the, the various intellectual and political projects that all uh, of these entities reflect sort of capture the way in which we imagine the sorts of questions, claims, and commitments that are at stake in uh, Are the Gods Afraid of Black Sexuality? Uh, also want to acknowledge our funders. Uh, this this uh, conference uh, is an extension of work that has been going on for about four or five years and the Arcus Foundation has been instrumental. I know Roz Lee, uh, our project officer, is here. Uh, Ann B. Day and the Carpenter Foundation have also provided a grant for the Center on African American Religion, Sexual Politics, and Social Justice, so we want to thank the Carpenter Foundation. And the Ford Foundation has also stepped up and provided us with a travel grant and want to thank them, thank Brad Braxton for his work there under the Office of the Religion and the Public Sphere. Uh, as Sam has already acknowledged, I want to uh, thank Sean Mendoza and Sharon Harris, especially in the team of student workers who were uh, working around the clock in the months coming, but especially in the last week. Sharon and I were texting late last night into the wee hours, not of my prompting, but of her making sure we were getting everything done. So thank you, Sharon. Thank you, Sean, uh, Mendoza. And then the core conference planning team was comprised of uh, Laura McTighe, who is a graduate student here and doing some amazing work and also has a long history as an organizer and activist and brought all those skills to bear in planning and helping pull this together. So thank you, Laura. And then the two core staff members of this new center, uh, Jennifer Leith, who last year was full-time here at Columbia uh, as a postdoctoral fellow in African American Studies, as well as assistant director for research. Uh, she has left us to another university just a little bit up I-95, uh, but is still very much involved uh, from her position at Harvard uh, in leading the, helping to lead the center's research agenda. And then Derek McQueen, um, who is a PhD student uh, close by at Union um, and is our Assistant Director for Community Partnerships. So if you could, again, please join me in just thanking this team of folks who...
And just wanted to very briefly, uh, two other things, tell you a little bit about the history uh, of uh, the work that has surrounded and um, been building up in preparation for this conference, and then give you a sense of where we hope to go over the next couple days. Uh, the Center on African American Religion, Sexual Politics, and Social Justice uh, was founded last year. This is our, our public launch. We hope to have a website launch, a virtual launch within the next couple of weeks. Uh, but in, in many ways, finding our home in IRAS is, is a logical fit, uh, given the long history of IRAS's work at the intersection of scholarship and activism. It's a long acronym. Uh, religion, African American religion, sexual politics, and social justice, uh, but that captures the way in which we hope to do both critical and constructive work and be attentive to the p possibilities and pitfalls of scholarship that emerges uh, at the intersection of research and activism. The history of this project, as Chaplain Davis has uh, indicated, began, in fact, as a research project in the not prof world. Uh, it took place in 2007 as a study and just happened to culminate at the same time that California uh, initial voting on Proposition 8 back in 2008, right? Uh, and we can remember that narrative very quickly as that legislation was passed. The burden for that legislation was largely weighed at the feet of African American communities and the narrative went something along the lines of African Americans are hyper-religious and therefore they're hyper-homophobic, and therefore this legislation passed. And typical, uh, as an academic, many of us might say, well, that's perhaps a little bit more complicated than that, and a whole host of journalistic and work complicated that narrative. Uh, and the center's work, which uh, in the ensuing years involved getting together a group of about 20 scholars, uh, activists, and religious leaders around the table, was invested in two sorts of projects, on one hand, complicating that narrative, right? Attending to the ways in which we knew there were much more sophisticated conversations around religion and sexuality taking place within black communities in American society more broadly, right? To do that work of calling attention to those more nuanced narratives, but at the same time suggest that there was work to be done, not just in black communities, but within religious institutions more broadly, that uh, could be invested in trying to not just create new spaces, but to support uh, and partner with the places where that work is already being done. Uh, in religious institutions, in activist organizations, in the so quotidian experience of black life, the way in which uh, there were more uh, generative prospects for thinking about African American religion, sexual politics, and social justice. And so uh, CARS was founded, that's the, the abbreviation, uh, one of the new Columbia acronyms for this Longer Center's work last year to continue to advance research, education, and public engagement at the intersection of religion, race, and sexuality with a particular eye to how this work is playing itself out in African American communities, both in the U.S. and abroad. So it's my pleasure to to celebrate, I want to thank all of our panelists, all of our participants, all of you who are here uh, for IRAS's fall conference, for CARS's launch, and I'm excited to sit down and just hear what the amazing folks who agreed to come have to say. So thank you. Hear me okay? Good morning. Um, I want to give a, uh, first off, I'm Professor Anthea Butler from the University of Pennsylvania. I'm in the Department of Religion and Africana Studies there. And I will be chairing today's opening plenary panel, Religion, Media, Markets, and the Making of Black Sexualities. Because I am a social media um, hog or maven, depending on how you want to put that, I want to say hello out there to all of those who are on the internet watching us. I have just tweeted out four different things about how to watch us on the internet. And and um, because I am a person who likes to tweet a lot and I appreciate every letter that I possibly get, there are two hashtags. I just created another one for this conference. The first one is hashtag are the gods afraid. That's the long one in case you just don't have a lot to say. But if you're like me and you have a lot to say, I'm going to encourage you also to use ATAG as a T. 
ATGA as another hashtag for the conference because that's four letters and it's really short and you'll be able to ask us questions and make comments. So the two hashtags again are, are the gods afraid or ATGA, okay? So either one of those will work for our conference, okay? Um, I am going to introduce the panelists to you. Each one of them will have 12 to 15 minutes. I have three notes in front of me. One is at the five minute mark, one is at the two minute mark and the other one says shut up. <laughs> So that means that if you get the shut up one, you know what that means, right? I want to encourage each one of you to look at your packets for the full bio on each one of these wonderful panelists. They will explain more about the, who they are here, but I will just go and introduce all of them through one line introductions. The first bio I have is Frederick Davey is the executive vice president of the Union Theological Seminary in the city of New York. Dion Haywood is the Executive Director of Women with a Vision, a community-based grassroots organization working in areas that include HIV AIDS protection, harm reduction, drug policy, health promotion, and human rights advocacy in the southern United States. Next, we have Darnell L. Moore, who is a writer who lives in Brooklyn, New York. He is a managing co-editor along with Tamara Lomax and Monica Casper of The Feminist Wire. Barbara Savage is a Geraldine R. Siegel Professor of American Social Thought at the University of Pennsylvania and Chair of the Department of Africana Studies, and I will always behave because she is my boss. <laughs> Finally, Bishop Christopher Sanyeho is a retired bishop of the Anglican Church of Uganda. Um, the suggested panelist order that I have been given is first, Professor Savage, second is Bishop Sanyeho, third is Fred Davis, fourth is Dion Haywood, and fifth and last is Darnell Moore. So we will go in that order. Thank you all, and um, Professor Savage, you may stand. Good morning, everybody, and thank you for coming. And certainly want to also thank um, Yosef and all the folks uh, here at Columbia who brought us together. Uh, having, I thought I was actually going to be the last person to speak, which this change in order means that all of the comments I was going to write while other people were talking uh, will have to come a little bit more simul simultaneously. But I just want to say a few things to um, really raise a series of questions and topics for discussion and debate as we sit here over the next couple of days and really want us to think together about the place of studies of sexuality, religion, and gender in the field of Africana studies, um, which includes the way I think about it, the study of the lives, the ideas, the lived and cultural practices of black people with special attention to those who live or have lived in the Americas, with the United States, Canada, South America, and the Caribbean, those on the continent of Africa, and in Europe and Asia. I think my principal aim to in these remarks is to argue that the study of the intersection of, of sexuality, religion, and gender must be central to the field of Africana studies, and that this work must begin with the field of intellectual history itself, with the history of ideas held by black people and others with power over black people, ideas about sexuality and all of its varieties, ideas about religion in all of its varieties, and about power in all of its manifestations. Power among and between people of differing sexualities, religions, genders, and between people and the state authorities who govern them. These ideas have an entangled history, and any attempt to develop an agenda for civil or civic equality and freedom of belief and expression across these differences must begin with the entanglement itself. Our work as scholars is to delineate them, to disentangle them, to debate them, and to develop strategies that advance this, this work, but more importantly, improve the lives and prospects of the people we study or their contemporary descendants and the communities in which they live. So as scholars committed to the study of black people across time and space, we must do this work, and we need to do it now, because the political ruptures and sometimes, in fact, oftentimes, the violence that we've witnessed and are witnessing demand it. So let me begin by interrogating both the notion of intellectual history uh, and then the notion of why we need to start there. I'm influenced in my thinking here uh, so much by my involvement over the last few years in a collaborative project on black women's intellectual history. 
Uh, and prior to that, another collaboration on women and religion in the African diaspora. Um, and I should say um, that th these collaborative projects really um, model a different way of doing academic work. And I think it's particular, that model is particularly needed in the work that we're setting about to do over the next couple of days. Um, so, and most importantly, I think, the other collaboration that I've been involved in is my work with the group behind this, this, uh, this effort, a group of us who started to meet and talk in 2010 about the ideas that you see encapsulated in the brochure uh, in front of you. But it's a, a, a group of scholars of theology and religion and history, gender, and pastors and ministers who ourselves have had to work on our own ideas and our own issues uh, among ourselves, and I think in ways that were profoundly moving spiritually and intellectually for all of us. So from all of these threads of collaboration, I've come again and again to understand the power of ideas, those we hold about ourselves and who we are as a collective, and the power of ideas people and power hold about us. And for me personally, as a black lesbian, who also aspires to be a scholar, who is also a person of faith, and one who believes deeply in personal freedom, in black freedom, and religious freedom, my involvement in these disparate but related projects have helped form the remainder of what I'm gonna say here uh, briefly. On the importance of intellectual history, first the definition of intellectual history is very expansive in my mind in terms both of its sources and whose ideas are worth studying. So I'm not talking about an elitist concept of intellectual history, but one that takes seriously the thoughts and ideas and writings and actions and speeches and lives of people who may be unlettered, but whose expressions of their thoughts are found in the lives they live the practices they embrace, the things they do and say, and the things they build and make. Whether that is art, or an article, or a written text, or an oral production, or the politics they practice and advocate. So we're talking about excavating and examining those ideas in a wide variety of settings and places and over time. But to the extent that Africana Studies embraces the tools of many disciplines and studies people in many regions, there is work here for all of us to do, whether we think of ourselves as Americanists or Africanists, scholars of the diaspora or students of religion, theology, anthropology, literature, critical race theory, science and health, art history, queer studies, sociology, political science. There is plenty of good work here to do. And I see this conference as a, as a way of beginning to think collaboratively across those disciplines under the rubric of Africana Studies uh, as, a, as a way of, of furthering that project. In part because Africana Studies has a radical multidisciplinarity to it, and it always have, and therefore I think it is a place where the work must continue to be done, and I think it has to be done collaboratively. This is the scholarly practice and preference, the, the scholarly practice and preference for solitary work, which I subscribe to deeply, must yield in this case to, uh, to coming out of the spaces where we, we do that work into active collaboration, because none of us are well trained enough to take on the challenge that this delineation, this disentanglement, and this debate requires. And so the challenge of this conference, in my, my mind, is to work toward developing a research agenda of sorts where there is work to be done together for all of us. Uh, that is, we need to model a new way of doing this work that pushes for a radical inclusiveness of disciplines, of people outside the narrow confines of the academy and of churches, that engages in the communities where we live and work. And the very history of black studies, of African American studies, of African diasporic studies has within it the model and the tools to address those questions, but also to address the question of why this work is so important and so related to the political and economic work on income inequality and the excessive use of force by the state, which is, which is um, effect in the way I see the, the, uh, this excessive use of force of the state, which is on display everywhere, um, to me it really is the policing of difference, the, the execution of difference, if you will, 
um, in the narrowest sense, uh, in the rawest sense of the word. So the excellent scholarship that we'll see here uh, in the rest, the remainder of the panels uh, today and tomorrow, I think will speak more loudly, certainly and more emphatically than I can and more clearly because there are people who are actually experts uh, in, in, the, in the fields that we're talking about, but will also demonstrate the importance of this work. So I expect that many of you are here as I am to learn and to listen, but also um, to represent those of us who are in the fields that I'm talking about, the fields of Africana studies uh, and those that I've laid out before. So I'm really here to add, a, a, I guess, a, a, an informal welcome and an invitation to think together over the next few days about what kind of research agenda we might want to develop and take back to our respective institutions or places of work and advocacy and how we can develop some model that is a sort of a long-term outcome of what's gonna be a really glorious uh, gathering these next two days. So thank you. friend delegates, delegates, I'm standing here as a counselor, as a pastor, and uh, who has been in this field for over 10 years. So what I'm going to say is not just uh, theoretical, but what I've found practically. I'm glad my wife is along, is here with me, Mary. I'm in a very strong ally of LGBTQ people. So with the counseling and uh, dialogue, I really understand what is going on on both sides? The heterosexuals and the LGBTQ people. Mary and I have been married for 50 years. We just celebrated 50 years of our marriage last year. So I know the side of the married people and those who are being denied marriage. First, the question is, are gods afraid of black sexuality? Because I've found fear really reigning in our African society. For instance, I come from Uganda, and I found uh, black sexuality is definitely not very different from what we generally in Africa are afraid of. But I say that gods are afraid of sexuality, human sexuality, but God himself is not. What is called gods, definitely, probably you can talk of cultures, traditions, uh, even religions. I'm a religious person, but uh, sometimes religions take on the image of, uh, they make themselves gods, a god. And the politics too. So when we take the place of God, we can say things which I don't believe the God, the creator of this universe, would not say that. God himself is not afraid of human sexuality. For that matter, of black sexuality. But the other gods which I mentioned, such as politics, cultures, and all these gods we have made for ourselves, 
seem to be against human sexuality. God himself created human sexuality. He's the creator of uh, heterosexuals. The majority, as we know, of our human beings are heterosexual. But he has also created the gay, the lesbians, the bisexuals, the transgenders, the intersex. And this is news which should be passed on. Many religious people don't like to say this. They think <laughs> that uh, the real people who are sexual, who would think about their sexuality, are heterosexuals. And this has created a lot of problems. But God created all this. And the purpose of human sexuality is very important to understand. The purpose is, one of them is procreation. Unfortunately, all down the history of our human race, procreation has been so much stressed on the expense of other uh, purposes of human sexuality. Companionship. Companionship is very important in a human sexuality. Even if you may not have children, you need companionship. People are being denied to have companions because they think you should, they are not likely to have children. Sexuality is needed for pleasure, 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 <laughs> pleasure. Sex is pleasurable. It is pleasurable. We shouldn't fear, get afraid of this pleasure. It is there. God created it. Follow down the history, pleasure has been very much denied, and you people, concupiscence, they say so much pleasure. No, 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 no. You should have sex for children. If you are going to have children, yes. But if not, but how many times do we have sex just for children? <laughs> Sexuality is for creativity. Creativity. I've been very much helped by my wife to create what I've been able to create. Probably if I didn't have this balanced sexual life, I wouldn't do many things I do. Many depressed people cannot do things. If you deny people to be what they are, some of them become depressed. I know a PhD person who has been so depressed because he was denied his sexuality that he is really living a very depressed life. He's not able to do anything. He thinks he's almost dead, dead, although he's alive. So we should understand sex as a purpose, not only for procreation, but procreation is important. But even those who may not have children, biological children, in, the, in them, <laughs> there is this intrinsic element in them of procre procreation. They love children. I've known people, bisexuals uh, and others, who really love their children, though they are not their own. They can care for these children. They can adopt children. So we shouldn't deny LGBTQ people to adopt children. Of course, our cultures, as I said, traditions, religions, politics, have been restraining people to enjoy their sexuality, and they have the right to have the sexuality which they have because they did not create themselves. We are liberated, however, by knowing the truth. And I'm a Christian. Jesus said, you know that when you know the truth, the truth makes you free. 
My church has taken a long time, but by dialogue they are learning. But I stood, though they have been very unhappy with me, my stand. But when I knew the truth, I've stood, and I'm continuing to stand. And I can see some changes, even in my church. And I should say again this. We have politics. We have uh, all the uh, other forces, our cultures, uh, traditions. All these are good. But God is above our cultures, above our politics, about, uh, above our everything. So we should not discriminate people using our cultures, our racial uh, preferences, or tribal, and so on. We should listen. What does God want us to do? The most important thing is love. Love, compassion, justice. And we have, where we have gone wrong, we should forgive each other and make amends, and make amends. In conclusion, I would just like to say there are some pitfalls as we practice sexuality. Rape. Well, some people go do rape others, which is not acceptable. Many people are hurt by rape. Uh, pedophilia, pedophilia, small children being persuaded into sexuality by adults, uh, pornography, making, becoming greedy because you try to expose yourself so much, pornography. Greed is not good, even with food. We should control ourselves. Incest, sadism, hurting other people, you feel you can enjoy yourself, though others are hurt. Sexuality is not like taking a glass of wine. You enjoy it, but the wine will not stop enjoying it. It should be mutual and by consent. So when you have this kind of sexuality, sadism and all that, it's terrible. And again, sexual transmitted diseases. There have been times in Africa where people have been dying from HIV AIDS because LGBT people are not having access to medical care. And you know here in 1980s, many people died because they were not accessing medical care and treatment. But we should not be afraid of our sexuality and hide. Because some people can, they are, can be el uh, completely eliminated. We know people can die out there uh, as human beings. If you leave disease to go on without being controlled, you may not survive. So we should be allowing people to express themselves. And I believe this is what we should do. In the 21st century, as I said, we are going to have a change. We are at the cross, crossroads to accept human sexuality as a whole, not just heterosexuality. Whatever research we do, whatever gods we believe in, they should not stop us to embrace the wholeness of human sexuality. Thank you. Good morning. I think I should just uh, thank uh, Bishop Sinyanjo and Barbara both, whom I know uh, very well, but particularly uh, the, the bishop, because Bishop Sinyanjo is uh, here from Uganda and is a fellow uh, at Union. And the very Union Seminary, which is across the street here, and the very uh, 
The very words that he expresses here, he expresses is in Uganda. And as a result of that, he has been uh, persecuted by the government there. Uh, he has been uh, exiled from his church. And he has been denied even the right to be buried with other clergy uh, because of the position that he takes uh, on behalf of LGBTQ people in Uganda. So I just want to thank him for his bravery and his courage. So I also want to thank Yosef Surrett for inviting me and to my fellow panelists for the opportunity uh, and the honor to uh, share with them in this portion of these next couple of days. And I think Yosef asked me to participate on this panel because of my past experience as a grant maker and as someone who's insisted on at least the consideration of funding of in non-traditional areas. I would like to use my time this morning to briefly review my life in both the public and private funding world and some of the lessons that I may have learned along the way that may or may not be instructive uh, to us um, as we deliberate here and then go back to our respective uh, places of both living and working. Um, and I would like to think of, to talk about or think about funding and supporting work in three ways. One is supporting creative people, two, supporting non-usual suspects, and three, um, pushing the boundaries. Um, as I mentioned, um, I have done a lot of, had a lot of my career um, in uh, funding and in the philanthropic world. I was a program officer at the Ford Foundation where I helped to develop uh, with, working with faith and community-based organizations programs that focus uh, quite a bit on community change and community change through faith-based uh, and community-based uh, organizations. One of the particular areas where I focused was on juvenile justice uh, and more specifically on a nationwide replication of a, of, a, of a very successful local program known as the Boston Ten Point Coalition that involved people like Ray, Ch Ray uh, Hammond and the very colorful uh, Reverend Gene Rivers who some people in this room may know. Um, and that program was used primarily to support um, it was primarily a program to support the reduction of gang violence, the reduction of incarceration, and the reduction of recidivism uh, among people living very much at the, at the margins. And at the time, um, the work that Gene Rivers was doing, the investment in faith-based organizations to do this work, the work that Ray Hammond was doing, and all those folks were doing through the um, through the Boston Ten Point Coalition for a place like the Ford Foundation um, was considered a bit suspect in terms of supporting it. But I decided that because there were creative leaders by way of Gene Rivers and Ray Hammond and others that it was really important for Ford to invest in this work. Um, and we did. And some of it continues even today. But I tell you that story only because it then provided me with the courage to take this a step further at Ford. When I got to Ford, there was discussion underway about whether or not the uh, foundation, and this was by then 1998, should actually invest in publicly, intentionally, um, uh, with uh, a great deal of expression invest in LGBT programs and LGBT organizations. And there was a committee that had been formed at Ford to actually look at whether or not this investment should actually happen. What I decided as kind of a renegade program officer was to find the creative leaders to pretend that I did not know that the actual committee was meeting to discuss whether or not to invest. And I found um, 
Rabbi Sharon Kleinbaum of Congregation Beth Simhak Torah, and Bishop Zachary Jones of the Uni Unity Fellowship Church. Uh, two very creative and courageous leaders on the front lines of building local congregations that would invite LGBT folks. And uh, I simply uh, took uh, the allowance that I got up to a certain point that could be approved by a director, which I think at that time might have been, might have been $50,000. And I simply did it. Um, because these were creative leaders doing cor courageous work, and I felt like it was important for Ford to do. It doesn't sound like a big deal um, 16 years later, um, but it was only a few years ago that the Ford Foundation actually developed a, um, an LGBT program where they committed $50 million over 10 years to fund LGBT work. And we sit, I sit here these few years later, uh, and it all almost seems normal. But I want to assure you that 16 years before, it was not. And even uh, five years or three years before, when Ford made this major initiative, it was a big announcement and a big deal. But we can only do that when we seek out and find uh, creative and courageous leaders and invest in them. My other position in philanthropy was with the Arcus Foundation and I see two of my uh, Arcus, um, uh, one former colleague and one current uh, person from Arcus here, Roz Lee and uh, uh, Cheryl Dudley. Um, but at Arcus I, ser I served as a, a Senior Director for Social Justice and LGBT Programs. And it was in this position that I managed the Foundation's investments in programs, including faith projects that supported the full inclusion of LGBTQ people in society and culture. Um, at Arcus, it was my contention that um, the LGBT community LGBTQ community and leaders had not heard from what I called non-usual, uh, unusual suspects. And that is, I felt that there were voices and narratives um, within certain communities that the leaders uh, in the LGBTQ community had not heard from. And around this time, I met uh, Yosef Surrett, uh, and I um, talked to Yosef about the need to um, make those unusual voices heard, to hear those other narratives, uh, to come to understand better what other people were saying about the intersection of religion and sexuality. And Yosef opened me up to a whole cadre of scholars of color, gay and straight, um, who were engaged in scholarship around this intersection of these two issues, and who were not known necessarily to the movers and shakers in LGBT circles, and who had insights into black religious and other religious traditions that were and are important to advancing LGBT inclusion in societies and communities. So as a senior director at Arcus and with Arcus's resources, um, I supported Yosef to organize several convenings of African-American scholars to offer new insights into the um, intersection of religion and sexuality. And with the support of Roz and uh, Tom Com and some other people at Arcus, that work, and, and, and Cheryl, that work continues today, and you see it manifested in this center that gets, gets launched here that you'll hear more about later. From where I sat at the time, I felt that the LGBT community as I knew it had not heard the voices of scholarly perspectives of many of, you, who, of many of those who were invited to these early convenings. And as a program director, and as a funder, I decided to see if we could get these unusual voices in the mix. 
It was my opinion then, and it's my opinion now, that these voices have been invaluable to the rapid changes we have seen in the social and political spheres uh, of LGBT communities. So fund creative leaders, support unusual voices. And a third and final point this morning is to push the boundaries of funding opportunities when you can. Two quick examples. At Public Private Ventures, um, I, where I, another place where I worked, uh, I had the privilege of managing, managing a national research and demonstration project focused on reducing recidivism among men and women re-entering society after long periods of incarceration. This work was supported to the tune of $18 million by the Bush administration with bipartisan support. The biggest champion of this program has become a friend. He is a heterosexual, white, male, evangelical Republican, which I'm not. <laughs> the program was called Ready for Work, and because it had some very early verifiable successes of reducing recidivism and keeping the formerly incarcerated uh, connected to labor markets, my Republican colleague and I decided, why settle for $18 million? So working with people in the White House and on Capitol Hill, we succeeded in getting President Bush to ask Congress for $300 million in the 2004 State of the Union Address to fund replications of key components of this work. This resulted in Congress funding something called the Second Chance Act, which still consists today, and supports reentry programs around the country. That was work uh, that was done in an era when no one wanted to be seen as soft on crime. But the point here is that we push the boundaries by capitalizing on a conservative president's faith and philosophical commitment to give people a second chance. Now another way, sort of like the Ford Foundation, where we push the boundaries in this work, was to insist that every single faith-based organization that was involved in the 17 cities around the country where we did this work did not discriminate against LGBTQ, LGBTQ folks, no matter how conservative or evangelical those faith institutions were, with the support of the Bush administration. And to our surprise, every single one of the participating faith-based organizations in that 17-city demonstration project committed to not discriminating against the people who came to their doors seeking services. One more example, one more public example. Um, I served on the White House, the first White House faith-based council under Obama, and now I sit at the um, My Brother's Keeper's table for this new My Brother's Keeper initiative. And in both cases, uh, I and others have been insisted on government considering the complexities of black male life. That is, government and its programs cannot focus on black men as monolith and attempt to make them all suburban middle class dad, dads who go to church every Sunday. I was a lone black gay voice on the President's White House Faith Council and created quite a few quiet moments in our deliberations by, by suggesting that all black men who make babies are not strictly heterosexual or that men of color initiatives that did not fund conversations and studies of the complexities of male sexuality would be woefully inadequate. Now those positions have not necessarily met with ringing endorsements, but I am pleased to see that last week a spokesperson delivering marks on, remarks on behalf of the president at a My Brother's Keepers initiative event mentioned the importance of remembering our gay, black, and other brothers of color in the work that the president is doing. So with this, I conclude. In some, in public and private funding circles, my experience has taught me, at least, the importance of supporting creative leaders, even in those areas where we're just breaking ground, to support the non-usual voices so that those other narratives can be heard, and then to push the boundaries every single chance we get whether in public or private settings, so that people like me aren't simply taken for granted. Thank you.
Good morning. I am, I think I'm overly excited about being here. Um, and for, since I heard that I would be speaking, I kept thinking about what am I gonna talk about? What am I gonna say? And then I said, well, I'm from the South. Our work is based in the South. Um, I am a black lesbian, uh, the child of a Pentecostal father, Pentecostal minister. Um, I'm sure I could come up with something. <laughs> um, and in saying that, I, was, I kept thinking, what place in this country can do where religion, criminalization, and policing affect two of the most vulnerable people in our society, two groups of people, and that's poor African-American women and members of the black LGBTQ community. You can't find that. I know it exists, but sometimes it looks no different than Uganda. And I say that to say that um, I became Women with a Vision's executive director uh, in 2006, right after uh, Hurricane Katrina. And in doing so, I just, I had no clue, one, what the job was. Um, I had been an organizer working for the organization since I was 19, um, while holding other jobs, but really had a commitment to this organization because it was unique. Um, they didn't separate people, even though when Women's Vision was started by eight African-American women who just decided they didn't like what they were seeing in their community, and they felt like they had a commitment to see, see it done differently, see things done differently. And so when I became executive director in 2006, it was because majority of those women who were still at the organization, they said they were tired. We don't want to do this anymore. You like talking to people, you do it. And upon doing so, I'm sure many of you remember um, just the stories coming out of New Orleans after Hurricane Katrina and what it was like um, from housing to the high level of policing and using military to control a community in the United States. And in a city like New Orleans, that's really not a large city. Those are the things that people heard about. But many people didn't know that while many of us were struggling to come home and help other people come home and rebuild, that the federal government at the time, the Department of Justice, gave the state of Louisiana millions of dollars to find their most violent uh, criminals so they can get them back. And I'm sure many of you know, if that happens, that means somebody's gonna get hurt and it's not the people that they're looking for. And so in 2006, we started doing what we know how to do best, looking for our clients, organizing community, seeing how we can help people. And by end of 2006, 2007, many of our clients, we have a history at Women with a Vision of working with uh, transgender women way before it was popular. I have to put that out there because, you know, there's, there is this assumption that um, black people don't help black people and we don't serve those people. But at Women with a Vision, transgender community has always been a part of who we served in terms of the services we offered at the agency. So, but after this 2007, we started, a lot of our clients started coming in and they were like, look at my ID. And I was like, what do you mean look at your ID? And many of them had sex offender in bold orange letters written across their either driver's license or state ID. Because we had this little thing in Louisiana called Statute 1489, Crime Against Nature, Louisiana's uh, Crime Against Nature statute, which meant if you were a sex worker or you were perceived to be a sex worker, or as many of our transgender clients say, just walking while trans, um, then you could be charged with the crime against nature. And 
again, I kept trying to tie this into religion and what that means. But again, y'all know we're talking about the South. Y'all know how the South is in religion. But I realized in the be as soon as we started seeing the number of people coming in, that a lot of the laws and the history of these laws were tied to people's religious beliefs. This statue that at this point, at this time, when we saw the outcomes of all of this money to target people, and Governor Bobby Jindal reissued an amendment to this law saying that if people were found that they would have to, they follow all federal guidelines, is any sex offender, that means if you are a rapist or a pedophile, then you would have to follow all federal guidelines um, to register as a sex offender. What this did was give police a reason to stop and arrest anyone they choose. Many of our clients weren't even involved in prostitution. They were simply walking down the street, a street known for prostitutes, but it's also an area for poor people where they live. Many of our clients really, for all intended purposes, were poor, struggling with addiction, homeless, homelessness, and mental health issues. So really what they needed was care and services not to be criminalized. But what we noticed was that nobody wanted to help. You're not gonna change this law. The law was actually written in 1806, I think, to keep gay men from having sex in the French quarters. Go figure, if any of you know New Orleans. Um, that's how this law came about. And so we looked at the history of it and it had been challenged multiple times. This law had been challenged. I mean, so many times that every lawyer we talked to, um, human rights lawyers, civil rights lawyers, nobody would listen. Nobody would take on the case. Um, many people said, you know you can't do this. Y'all are black. Um, they're gonna run you, you're black and you're lesbian. Um, it's not gonna work. And I was like, well, somebody has to think that something is wrong with this, that we're criminalizing people and we're also putting them at risk for HIV. We're putting them at risk for homelessness and we're putting them at risk for violence by police, but also by the community in which we live. And so what we did was we started talking to the little old ladies at the church. Now, I didn't think this was gonna work, but we went with it. But we started just holding community meetings, engaging communities, talking to people, and it really boiled down to one thing, basic human rights. Once we sit down and talk to people and said, I don't care if you don't like transgender people, I don't care if you don't like poor black women, but isn't it something about us that everybody should have a right to have a job? Everybody should have a right to housing. Everyone has a right just to live their lives. And they would say, well, yeah, they do. And this became our first on the ground support for this campaign. And then we worked with the Center of Constitutional Rights. And they, of course, took on the case. Thank God they took on the case. But what we did, we started doing the research and we just knew that it had to be led in a certain way and we collected stories of over 200 uh, transgender and African American women who were charged with uh, crime against nature. And we looked at how 97% of the people on the sex offender registry in Orleans Parish were African American. 80% of those people were women. And so it was amazing to us how this law that was designed for gay men hit the next population of people we know society loves to hate. And that is the image of poor black women. And it was at that moment we realized that we really needed to not only challenge the law, but challenge what the state and the church has put in place for people. And how so many of these women were so broken simply because they had nowhere to go. There wasn't a church that they could go to that they could be a part of. There wasn't family members, because most family members were ashamed 
of them, and not only, because it, was, it wasn't just about their ID. Following the federal guidelines meant that you had to mail out postcards saying that you're a sex offender. How many of you have gotten those in the mail saying that there's somebody in your area? So for these women who had children, that meant that they could not walk their children to school. You weren't allowed on school grounds. Um, you could not be hired because your ID said sex offender. And so we started not only holding meetings with the community, but we started creating a space for trans women, cis women, gay men, whoever had the charge that fell into this category to really spend time together and realize how much more they had in common than if they were separated. And so we built this campaign out and we called it No Justice. And when we started the campaign, again, the lawyers at CCR, they said, you know you're not gonna win. We never win. I was like, what do you mean you never win? We never win, we don't win cases. I mean, we just fight them to get them in a the public eye. And I was like, well, I feel like we need to figure out a way to do this. And so one of the things we did was we hit Louisiana politicians. I just started, we got in the van, we took everybody. Took everybody up to Baton Rouge and we let them talk. And they would approach politicians and they would say, you say I'm worthless. You say I'm not a part of this society, but you're keeping me from being, a, not being in this society. You're keeping me from having a job. You're keeping me from having a quality of life that I have a right to. And so with that challenge, believe it or not, we found a lawmaker who decided to sponsor the bill to change the law. And that was the beginning. And of course it was challenged and it went to the Supreme Court and it was ruled unconstitutional and the statute was removed. But upon removing it, thank you. Um, that law, y'all at the state, we weren't gonna win and not change. But I really know that to this day, it was the voices of the people most affected. It was the voices of trans women standing up and said, I'm not gonna be sexually abused anymore by police. I am not gonna stand for it anymore. And you're gonna accept me and I'm gonna be here. It was at that moment where we realized that a part of this work is about giving people the space to be themselves and giving people the space to know that they belong. Like it, it, it was so humbling to see people every day just feel like they did not belong. That is a very painful thing to watch. But it is the most beautiful thing to see people come into themselves and see so many of our clients now, they're like, what are we fighting next? And so this is just to say, this is how we build a movement. This is how we create avenues of change for the most marginalized people in our community. And to see a group of transgender women and women sit and talk, they were like, wait, that happened to you? That happens to me. Wait, I didn't know, I thought it was just us. And so often this is the way our community operates is we think it's just us. And so at Women With A Vision, we are extremely excited about that win, but it's not over. Because as much as we fought for four years, and I really thought I was ready to hit up funders and anybody else, because I thought this will, it's not gonna happen in my lifetime, but I could prepare for it. I don't think it will change, but it did. But criminalization is used as a way to marginalize and put away the most vulnerable people in our, in our society. Even though we fought this law and we had it changed, which actually removed over 800 individuals off the sex offender re registry in Louisiana, It didn't stop them from keep coming for us. And when I say for us, because I feel like you're coming for me when you come for mine. Um, and so this last legislative session, we had a lawmaker that um, passed a bill that gave police the right to stop anyone they think is suspected of sex work. Even though we have laws against prostitution, 
the law passed. And the main reason it passed was because people were complaining because on their way to church on Sunday morning, they have them people out there. And we didn't want church people to see this. And that was the reason he sponsored this bill. And so it's that moment when I realized I am fighting something bigger. That people's moral compass is broken. That you think it's all right to call the police on a largely African-American community of people who are really in need of public health, mental health, and services because you don't want to see them when you go to church on a Sunday morning. It says a lot about the work we have to do. But we're committed at, in New Orleans, around the South. Um, we just received some funding to take what we do to Jackson, Mississippi. Lord. <laughs> but I feel like it's important. It's important because people in Jackson and throughout Mississippi feel like it's just them. And people in Louisiana think it's just them. But there is no black LGBTQ agenda. Did y'all notice that? There is no agenda for us and our rights and what we need and what's important, and it ain't marriage. And so I would encourage all of you, before I sit down, to really think about and think about these policies, because I realize most people don't think about them when they hear them, or these laws. Like, we are over police, y'all. And I don't have to go into, for, for us, as African Americans in this country, what that means. And what that means to our communities that they say are broken, that they say are not well, and are not operating as they should, well, mainly it's because you keep jumping in it and policing to a level that's keeping people out of community. Thank you. Good morning. Um, I just wanted to start by thanking um, the center for hosting this amazing gathering. And then personal thanks to uh, Sister Jennifer Leith, who, after I said to her last night, I don't know what I'm going to talk about tomorrow, said to me, you should probably remember Ferguson. And then also sisters Leslie Callahan and Mike, and brother Mike Slack, who around the dinner table yesterday talked about Ferguson. And then also brother Michael Brown, who I also was walking with back from our dinner, who I turned to and said, I don't know what to talk about tomorrow. And he said, tell them that they're killing our children. And then I want to thank Brother Larry Fellows III, who is a freedom fighter on the ground in Ferguson, part of the Millennial Activist United group, who's also black and queer. He's right there. Stand up, brother. I've um, been following his work and supporting his work and thinking about the connections between the force of anti-blackness and the ways in which it shapes our conceptions of sexuality. 73 days ago, Mike Brown Jr., an 18-year-old black teen, was shot several times by Darren Wilson, a white police officer. The killing of Mike Brown has positioned Ferguson in a public imagination as a contemporary Selma a site of civil unrest and provocation in response to anti-black, state-perpetuated, and sanctioned violence. A site where a mostly black populace will not allow the murder of one of their own to go forgotten, dismissed. Mike Brown's death was in no way disconnected from the other forms of blue on black crime and types of vigilante-style murders that have ended the lives of black people in St. Louis or elsewhere. Mike Brown's death is not disconnected from the murder of 19-year-old Renisha McBride, shot in her face and killed after seeking help at the home of Theodore Wafer, the perpetrator in a suburb of Detroit. 
22-year-old Jonathan Crawford shot dead by police in an Ohio Walmart while holding a toy gun. Ayanna Jones, Trayvon Martin, Rakia Boyd, Eric Garner, Miriam Carey, Azal Ford, and so many other black, cisgender, and transgender women, girls, boys, and men. These murders signify the valuelessness of black life in the US. And in St. Louis in particular, a city replete with examples of the various ways white racial supremacy has been reified in municipal laws and evidence in the tense relationships between police and the black folk who reside there, black life ain't worth shit. So much so that the black public was made to experience a neo-lynching, a moment when a lifeless body killed for being suspicious, shot for being non-docile, deadened because of an attempt to actually live, was left on display in a densely populated but small black neighborhood in the street for four hours. Friends, family, neighbors who were strangers, passerbyers in a Canfield section of Ferguson were made to peer upon Mike's blood-drenched black body for four hours. The killing turned public spectacle was a type of pedagogical, pedagogical moment meant to teach black folk about the ways in which we are to behave remind us of the consequences that await us if we deny the state its power. Instruct us so that we understand that black life, black life is so insignificant that the broader public, some of whom are black, won't lose any sleep if our bodies are left to lay prostrate in a US street, dead. In fact, they will keep living and attempt to feed their presumption with the real truth. Here was a black weed smoking thug who had it coming to him. And we should go, and should we get the nerve to speak back to power, to ask for truth instead of lies, the black will be met with tanks in the street, shot with rubber bullets in our chest, burned with tear gas eating away at our eyes, have our bodies caged in jail cells subsidized by the same federal dollars used to support the attorney general's office, who we pray will ensure a just process of oversight. But our prayers seem to almost always go unanswered. To be black in an anti-black society is to be a commodity fit for liquidation. It is to be already evidence is not befitting of life. It is to live under surveillance and always positioned as a potential threat. It is to live under the condition of, conditions of carcerality, of various forms of imprisonment, of our senses of self, of our expressions, of our bodies, of our gender articulations, of our sexualities. How then do we free ourselves of the lure of anti-black self-think? How might we think differently about ourselves, contrary to the ways we are otherwise instructed by the state, by the corporate sector, by the church? How do we become abolitionists of both the prison industry, capitalizing on black bodies, and the prison cells restricting the expansive nature of our sexed selves? How might we begin to locate police, police brutality next to capitalist exploitation of black laborers, next to poverty, next to housing discrimination, next to ed educational inequity, rape culture, queer and trans antagonism, ableism, citizen centrism, deaf dealing theologies, and much else aimed at harming black folk within the same metrics, matrix of anti-black oppressions. In other words, how can we create a black, body-loving, pleasurable, non-harmful, expansive view of sexualities in a society that does not love the black body? How do we think through and express black sexualities that are not artifacts of years of anti-black conditioning? To free ourselves, our bodies, and our desires, we must rethink and expand our senses of ourselves and our racial justice frameworks. It is easy for some of us to place Ferguson at the center of racial justice work at present. Emotions are high, are rightly so. Righteous indignation is what many of us feel, and yet it is so easy to forget that racial justice, the type that insists upon the securing of justice for all, all black lives, not just cisgender heterosexual men, can only be achieved through an expanded vision of liberation and a move from a type of just us 
that is patriarchal, heteronormative, and restrictive. Unless all black lives matter to us, anti-blackness and its contingent features will continue to deaden us. Our inability to expand racial justice frameworks in such a way that is purposefully and radically intersectional, self-reflexive, and expansive results in us reinforcing the anti-black logic that some of the black deserves invisibility, policing, and death. That is why it's possible for a preacher like Reverend Jamal Bryant the notorious pastor of Empowerment Temple AME Church in Baltimore, Maryland, to show up at a large gathering at the Shaffetz Arena in St. Louis University during a weekend of resistance of Ferguson October and speak from the stage about justice as if his Sumernic rant on black liberation for the black folk in St. Louis was not at all complicated by the many misogynistic, sexist, and homo-antagonistic sermons preached from his own pulpit. One must ask, one must ask if the quote, unloyal holes, Bryant recently preached about at his church, factor as those blacks who deserve justice too. What I'm trying to do is to draw our attention to the myriad ways anti-blackness works to pervade our imaginations, politics, and our theologies of sexuality. And by anti-blackness, I mean any apparatus our ideology that renders any black life futile and appropriate for annihilation. If we are to talk about religion, media, markets, and the making of black sexualities, we must therefore contend with the force of anti-blackness in a society, a marketplace, where whiteness is commodified and blackness deemed useless. Any tool of the market, then, be it media, and in some cases religion, will be used to construct an image of black people help proliferate ideas about black sexualities, shape our gender expressions as black people in ways that will always benefit the market. And never us, never all of us, never women, never queers, never trans brothers and sisters, never the undocumented, never the disabled. And a market organized is around the imagined normative family, always patriarchal, always economically a step above those who are imagined as drying up the state's resources always married, always white, black folk remain among the queer assemblage in the public imagination, always non-normative, which, which is why, which it, why it makes sense that some of us fight so hard to disprove the image of the contemptible black person lodged in the public imagination. We fight to be seen as normal, acceptable, and worthy. And too often, religiosity is positioned as the bully pulpit upon which claims about right and natural sexualities are laid. This is why it's important for us to question how black sexualities are conceptualized, theologized, and actualized in this moment, this moment of Ferguson resistance. The sooner we realize, however, that America was Ferguson before Ferguson ever was, the sooner we might realize the force of anti-blackness has always been at work shaping our ways of being and non-being in the world, our self-representations, and our conceptions of sexuality. Here now, we find ourselves existing in a time of dissent. No more will our bodies be left in the street. No more will we allow sagging pants, loud music, seemingly suspicious looking items in our children's hands, our being in the wrong place at the wrong time, police quotas, our blackness to be a cause for our deaths by the police or others. No more. We are beginning to name the state as a culprit and imagining justice as that which can be achieved without state intervention. Here now we find ourselves in a moment where counter-hegemonic politics are necessary. Indeed, a scholar activist Frank Wilderson contends, quote, blackness is a positionality of absolute dereliction, abandonment in the face of civil society, and therefore cannot establish itself or be established through hegemonic interventions, end quote. Therefore, a politics and practice of black liberation that seeks to upset the hegemonic order of white racial supremacy, of capitalism, of patriarchy, of heteronormativity, must resist reinforcing that which it seeks to dismantle. In fact, a radical politics and practice of black liberation in this moment won't be marketable under those normal conditions. Offering plates will come up short when we preach counter-hegemonic messages, to be sure. The question now before us is a simple one. Will religion or any forms of black religiosity be used as tools of the market to further perpetuate the types of violent black hating, 
black body despising theologies that render black folk, queer folk, trans folk, women, the disabled as insignificant black lives? Or can it be used as a spirit force illuminating the truth that all black lives matter? If it does not choose the latter, it too can be counted as an apparatus of the anti-black project, imprisoning and detoning our people. In response to anti-blackness, we proclaim that black lives matter. It is a political proclamation, but it is also an intervention in the face of policies, ideologies, and systems that would deem otherwise. The sooner we realize that some of the black are still assailed, that some of those who are killed are queer, trans, bi, disabled, and so much else, the better. The sooner we realize that some of the black are killed by deadly theologies, white racial supremacy, patriarchy, sexism, and rape culture, the better. So many of the black are trapped within restrict restrictive gender boxes that function as ideological prison cells. When we realize that black bodies are not valued, and then some less so than others, the better. Black queer folk matter. Black trans folk matter. Black women matter. Black disabled people matter. The black undocumented matter. The black poor matters. All black lives matter. And are proclaiming these truths, whether from the pulpit or on the street corner or within media, is a counter-hegemonic act of resistance in a world bent on reminding us of an always present desire for our demise. Thank you. I came looking for a word this morning. I believe I got it. Thank you. I, I just want to add one thing about media because it's a thing that we probably haven't talked about a lot. One of the things that is really striking to me is that where do you hear the stories from? Who speaks the stories of, of people? Whether we're talking about LGBTQT or we're talking about straight black people, whoever we're talking about, who are the people that tell our stories? And recently there was a, a case down in Alabama, I don't remember the name of this pastor, who announced to his congregation that he was HIV positive. The congregation was very willing to keep him in the pulpit. Two weeks later he said he had been sleeping with several of the women in the congregation. And then a battle ensued. The battle ended up with the church having to take him to court. They got the keys. I don't know if they got the bins back, but they got the money back. Why do I bring up the story? I bring up the story because nothing that we do here in this room is going to have any worth or any good until we start to bring down the religious leaders that continue to abuse and hurt our people. The Jamal Bryants, the Eddie Longs, Ed Al's of the world who have decided that it is okay to rape and pillage our children, to sleep with the women in the congregations and leave them pregnant, to tell us about how to be respectable when they and themselves are not respectable. If there is any work to be done here, the first work you must do is to topple down the gods that call themselves gods. We have idols in the black church. These idols have decided that they can speak to us and tell us what to do and show up in Ferguson to pretend that they care about you when they don't give a good damn. They want media time. They want the money. And this is not just happening in this country, let's think about Africa. Let's talk about the ways in which we have not talked about um, gay people have being abused in Africa and arrested in places like Nigeria and Uganda and other places where we don't hear that from our regular pastors in our communities. We hear this on news broadcasts. So I want to encourage us today that while we have this discussion, we must think about knocking down some gods. Because some of the gods we got ain't gods. They are demons. And they have done enough destruction in our community. You cannot talk about valuing black life until black people start valuing each other. Because one of the things that has happened that we have ingested what the white supremacist government has told us what we need to ingest about ourselves. 
And sometimes people ain't your friend, they are tools. And until we begin to talk about the tools that are being used to oppress people sexually, we cannot become free. So with that, let me open this up for questions. If there's anybody on the panel first that wants to respond to each other, I want to give you all an opportunity to do that. Or else we will open it up to the floor for questions if nobody else has anything to want to say on the panel to each other. Let me ask you to do two things for me. Number one, identify yourself very quickly. Number two, be brief. This is not for you to preach today. I will cut you off. I have no problem with that. You may ask Professor Savage this. I do this all the time at Penn. I ain't got a problem with it. So I'm just letting you know now. Um, we would like people to come to the mic, please. Yes, if you the don't mic mind, right if you have a question. Okay. Excuse me, if you have a question, please. And please mic. direct it. If you want to direct it to all the panel, say all the panel. If you're directing a particular person, please call their name. Okay, I'm going to be the first. Hi, my name is Ted Kerr. I'm a student at Union Theological Seminary. And uh, just a quick comment first, uh, people in the US uh, living with HIV still do die of AIDS due to lack of access. Um, and we as a global and national AIDS uh, movement have failed um, if people don't know that, and I'm sorry about that. Um, and uh, I guess I have a question. Uh, I also want to say that we're in a moment where thanks to prevention advancement, some people without HIV are getting access to AIDS medication to increase their life chances. Um, so my question out earlier. is, thank you. Yeah, yeah. Uh, so my question is, what can in this conference, what can we do in terms of black sexuality and gods to make sure that the national and global AIDS movement is addressing access and addressing sexuality better? Thanks. Thank you. Well, I think one of the ways personally, and I'll let anybody else answer this panel, is to still talk about this as a real scourge in communities. I think that people don't know half of the statistics that are involved, first of all. There is an assumption that this is over. Um, I actually was watching um, an interesting timeline thing going on in my timeline last night on Twitter about the, the use, of re, use and reuse of condoms which was just sort of appalling to me, which means that we haven't been talking about the beginning of prevention, let alone everything else. And I think this is part of it. And, and also, I think the kinds of actions that were happening in the middle and the end of the 80s and beginning of the 90s, maybe we need to bring some of that back into the forefront again on the streets. Because I do believe that this illness has gone underneath and that we have pretended that it doesn't exist anymore and it is only these cases like the case of a pastor that I talked about that we realize that there are people still around us struggling with this and don't have access to medication and we need to think about how to do that differently. Dion. Dion. Can you hear me? Yeah, yeah, yeah. Mm. just pull the mic up close to yourself. So you the biggest thing for me um, when I think about HIV in this country and outside of this country is access and education. Um, maybe about, I want to say maybe five years ago, the Center of Disease Control shifted their focus to uh, test and treat. Test and treat meaning set up testing, people, you get tested, you get treated. Um, they lo no longer invest in prevention education as a way to deter the disease. But it wouldn't be me if I didn't sit here and say that social determinants of health, and I get tired of saying that word, I get so tired of saying that, because I feel like uh, black people have been struggling with poverty in this country for a very long time. And some of the conditions that exist, including the criminal justice system, all have impact on HIV rates in this country. Um, the buzzword for around uh, HIV criminalization is this big thing everybody's talking about and I'm annoyed by it. I'm annoyed because when you think about the rates of HIV in African American uh, black men, uh, African American men who have sex with men, then HIV criminalization kind of comes later in life when many of them are involved in a criminal justice system early on, and for many of them, not by choice. And so the conversation needs to be brought to the forefront. We need to stop dancing around what needs to be done and really waiting for other people to, to tell us how we're gonna deal with this. Um, 
and it really is gonna take a lot of action, I agree. It's gonna take the voices of all of us to say we're tired of you deciding how education or how this is gonna be dealt with in our community and demand that something be done. Um, because they tell us, well, you know, poor people have this and poor people have this. So if we don't start dealing with some of the economic issues we're facing for people of color in this country, we're gonna remain where we are. like to add that st stigmatization is a very big problem. People fearing to say they are bisexuals, especially people hiding. Uh, they have a, a wife, but uh, they pretend that they don't have sex with the men if they are men. And this we call DL, <laughs> down law, right? And uh, I think we need to fight this discrimination where people fear what they are. I find in our churches, actually I'm not a person of this country, but I discover many churches are anti-LGBTQ uh, in their preaching, in their talks and all that. And this is causing many believers to hide what they are. And they are afraid to go even to the doctors. So I think the more people understand that uh, God did not, as I, was, as, as I was saying, that not only heterosexuals are people whom God loves, but God loves everybody, whatever one's sexuality is. I think uh, people will continue hiding and then infect other people and in knowingly. The next question. Yes, hi, I'm Mignon Moore, sociologist at UCLA, joining the Barnard faculty this uh, January. And I want to say, really appreciate this wonderful panel, what each of you has contributed to this conversation. And as I was listening to you, I was thinking about two things, region, and class, and I was wondering if uh, uh, Ms. Haywood, uh, Mr. Moore, or any of you who have experiences in places like the South or other regions where we don't hear as much about the liberation of black LGBTQ people, if you could say uh, something about uh, some of those differences, you know, um, some of the struggles that are happening there. And also, uh, you touched very poignantly on social class, Ms. Haywood, and I wanted to know if uh, any of you would be willing to address some of the class issues you see as we progress as a society into acceptance of um, LGBT rights. You would ask that question. So when I think about class, and I'm, I was born and raised in New Orleans. I'm one of those people I absolutely love the South in spite of. I think it's a unique experience for um, LGBTQ people in the South because being black is one thing and having any of those identities means something else and it complicates things. And it complicates things when I think about the transgender community. Most people leave school by age 13. And they end up living a life where they're surviving and they're on the street. I would say the same thing for many young gay men. Um, and so education becomes an issue in a region in our country where the educational system itself is broken. Um, and so that's one piece of it. I feel like when I made the comment about there's no agenda, um, and I'm a person who I don't have any problem calling names, HRC, Human Rights Campaign, has swooped down because the South is a popular place now, that place that people have ignored for years. And when I say that place that people have ignored, that place where we've ignored the conditions, we've ignored 
the incarceration rates, we've ignored poverty, we've ignored how pervasive white supremacy is and racism is in the South. We've ignored those things, but now it's a hotbed and a fun place for people to be. Meaning that I'm gonna swoop in because we wanna pass this marriage. We wanna make marriage legal. And I'm, I'm here to say I love my partner. I would love to marry her, but what would it mean if I'm not gonna get her benefits if she died? and she can't get my social security, what does that mean for black people, majority people in the South, black LGBT people live in poverty, majority of lesbian women, black lesbians have children. What does that mean for us? There is no agenda for us. And I tell people, people say, well, why aren't black, why aren't black LGBT people doing more about our movement? I say, well, which movement would you like us to be in? As a person who has an adult son, and my grandson is 13 years old, so it's like trying to choose what side you're gonna be on, which is why it is my feeling, and many of us believe as leaders, as activists in the South, is that we need to find a way to remove the image that marriage is our agenda, because it's not the right for me to have housing, the right for me to worship, the right for a mother to bury her, her child who may have died of HIV, but the church he's been singing in the choir for his entire life has refused to hold the services there because he died of HIV, uh, uh, HIV AIDS complications or whatever. All of those things matter. So there's no agenda addressing the needs of our community that anyone could see. And there's really hasn't been a platform for us to put those out there. And so it is, for a lot of us in the South, we are hoping to change what that looks like. That Mississippi, Louisiana are at will states, meaning that they can fire you if, I come, if I'm a transgender woman and as I'm transitioning, I don't like the way you look anymore, so please don't come back, you're fired. These are all the things that affect how we move around the world, how we're out. Like people talk about, oh, come out. Come out. What does that mean for black people? And I truly understand that I'm in a privileged place that I, and I don't know if I, I feel like I fought to be that. You know, I fought to be out like I'm just not going to be in. I don't know if my personality would ever fit that, but it's extremely hard for people to be who they are without losing everything they have. And that's what that looks like in our community. And so even if you're a professional and you have something to give back in your community, you're gonna think twice about how out you wanna be. If you are, we, I, and I'm just gonna say this quickly, how deep that self-loathing feeling is. I have a, a friend who's a, a teacher in the public school system in New Orleans. And I know she's a lesbian. A lot of people know she is, but she's never really said it. And she's not out at the school. But she loves telling my partner and I stories about the number of, of children who, I don't know how these children make it in school every day because they're forced to wear the girl shoes, the standard girl shoes instead of the boy shoes they want to wear. It's like that deep. And having principals say, well, we're going to just put her out if she don't wear those girl shoes. Really, we're telling a black child, you can't, a black principal is going to tell a black child because you are butch or you are masculine. If you don't wear these girl shoes, you can no longer come to school. We have a problem. And so the work really is about acceptance and working on stigma and educating people. And it's true. It's true to think that you would rather her be out, out of school just because she didn't wear those shoes than for her to be getting an education. And so there are, there are a lot of issues, but I feel like the biggest struggle is what it's important to us and what do we need to do to move us forward. If you have a question from the audience and you can't come out to reach the middle mic, um, just raise your hand up and somebody will bring the mic to you. Go ahead. Hi, I have a question and also an invitation. My question is that a lot of you have brought out how people have been killed, beaten, harassed, etc., because of who they are, whether they're just like Michael Brown or transgendered or gay. My question is, how can this be ended fundamentally? I agree with what person was saying about through fighting you can change things but I think there's a question about 
really ending it, which I think has to, has to um, do with what kind of system that we're living under that treats people like criminals. Um, but my invitation is that this question is going to be addressed. It's called Revolution and Religion, a dialogue between Cornell West and Bob Avakian. And it's on the fight for emancipation and the role of religion. So I want to invite you and everybody else here to come to Riverside Church on November 15th. But this is a question I'm asking you, is how do you see it could be ended? So if you can't make it to Riverside Church for that conversation, look in the mirror <laughs> and begin to ask um, ourselves the type of questions um, about our commitments to anti-black posture. And I'm using anti-blackness specifically and not just white racial supremacy because anti-blackness is uh, a type of sort of ideology and posture that white, black, brown, anyone can sort of take up. Um, so it is, it is a question. <laughs> what you're asking of us, I think, in that question is how do we create a new world, right? So here we have various systems in place that are organized around notions of anti-blackness. Um, what do you do in a world like that? Um, I think we've always, the black have always been resisting <laughs> through the very fact of our living but what you're raising are political questions, and I think we need to do some new things um, now. For instance, I ask folk all the time, how do we think about justice? So in the case of, a, we're talking about Mike Brown, what does justice look like in an instance like that? Somebody would say that justice looks like getting Darren Wilson in prison. And that might be a viable idea of justice. But then there are those who would say, well, those prison abolitionists who would say that the prison complex itself which is sort of the behemoth <laughs> bloating, being sort of being built off of the backs and, and bodies of black and brown folk may not be the sort of viable end um, as a means of sort of enacting justice. So in moments like this, what do we do when the very tools we, be, we thought were gonna be used for justice, prisons, police, the military, become the very forces that are also destroying your community? So we're, we have to ask ourselves some different set of questions now. Um, who, if they can't save us, who will? And how might we reimagine not only justice, but the, the routes to justice in this moment? when we know that something like the state cannot wholly be relied upon to do the saving when the state is also killing us. Sorry. Um. I don't quite know how to do this, but um, I wonder what kind of counter-narratives we can create for our kids. Um, you know, I grew up poor, black, gay, uh, in the South, right? And when you look at the image is held up as perfection in American society. It's white, male, heterosexual, rich, usually good-looking, used to be Christian, but that doesn't much matter anymore. And what I personally had to do along the way was to undo all the negative stuff that everybody had told me about every one of those things. I had to dismantle what people had told me about what it meant to be poor. I had to deconstruct what people told me of what it was, what it meant to be gay. I had to uh, reimagine my life as a deep chocolate black man. You know, all of those things. And that's a lot of work, you know. But what helped me was that there were other narratives out there. You know, I grew up before there was, and I'm going to blame it a little bit on this. I'm going to get in some trouble. I grew up before there was hip-hop and rap. I didn't, have that, I didn't have that stuff drilled into my head every day that I had to be a certain way. I had other stuff, but I didn't have that. And so those other narratives that I was able to grab hold of helped me move beyond 
all the sort of negative things that were at the heart of and inherent in being poor, black, and gay. Where are those counter narratives now? And how do we get them infused into the mass culture so that my nephew, who graduated uh, third in his class uh, and went to school on uh, scholarships, uh, doesn't decide that what he'd rather do is be a thug and leave school and get his pit bull and walk the streets and sell weed for the rest of his life, which is exactly what has happened. Where are those narratives to help him do that? I, um, for all of the counter narratives that we can offer, for all of the times you pull your sagging pants up, um, for all of the times that my black gay self from Camden, New Jersey, have had to remind myself that even after leaving public school to go to private school, um, to not be the quote unquote thug, that never stopped the police from stopping my ass on the street. Thank you. Um, and I, I really, really, I, this, it, it, it bothers me so, and I'm, I'm gonna be very honest, this, I'm so glad we're having this conversation because we're pointing at the wrong, the, 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 yes. Yes, 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 yes. The problem isn't the 17 year old who decides by volition because he or she has agency to sag pants. The problem is the imaginary or the idea in our sort of culture that says that the black body already is always criminal and terrorist and threat anyway. So regardless of whether, of, of whether I come through the lines of sort of a respectable sort of a line or a career, none of that stops the, the sort of rates of stop and frisk from decreasing. It doesn't stop the rates of black and brown bodies, regardless of how they're sexually identified and express their gender, from being viewed upon as terroristic threats in communities that they live in. It doesn't stop us, regardless of how much money I make. I live in bed -Stuy. I live in bed -Stuy. I went to good schools. I have access to good things. I have resources and folk around me. That does not stop the police from looking at me crazy when I'm walking down the streets, and it never will. We have to fight and call out the system. Time out for blaming us when we are not the problem. White racial supremacy and anti-blackness is the problem. And, and, and this is my problem also with the MBK initiative, yes? This sort of line of thinking that if we save, if we save and correct the black man, black man, forget the fact that there are women and, and, and girls burning in the house on fire too. If we save the black man and somehow we're gonna save our black community, the government ain't trying to save none of us. White folk ain't trying to save none of us. Time out and we need to change that conversation. And I think the narrative, <laughs> y'all, I'm sorry. You see, this, I apologize. But, 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 but this is actually at the core of what I think our issue is. We are, we are focusing so much on what we need to do to be better black folk in a system that don't give a damn about any of us anyway. Well, yeah. oh, sorry. No, well, my follow-up question. I'm from the Department of Africology, University of Wisconsin, Milwaukee. I have my colleagues with me. <laughs> sorry. Oh, that's right. Um, follow-up question. Um, I do work on black girls. We do a lot of black girl um, initiatives. That's always been my focus. And my follow-up question, because I'm a practical person, is you know, what do you all envision going forward with this whole notion of counter narratives, going forward with how there's a national initiative on black men, yet the, the newest cases for HIV is black girls and women, right? So, the, you know, for me, as a student, as a budding scholar, right, um, how should we go forward in terms of doing these workshops for black girls? Um, how, do you, how do you go forward? What would you like to see in terms of those that work with the youth. I'm not <laughs> <laughs> I, I don't know if Dion want to. Dion, do you want to say something so, first, or I, I, I actually have a couple. Of things so <laughs> this is so good. This is so amazing. 
I, and I, before I answer your question, I have to thank Darnell for what he just said. But I would also have to say that whenever people talk about black girls, black women, we already know we're the forgotten ones. And based on what happened just now, I have to, I, I can't help but mention the, you know, how respectability politics play into that for black girls, um, like the good black girl, like, you know, a lot of people like to say I'm the right kind of black lesbian. You know, I wear a dress. You know, I, I like Mac. That fits and that's comfortable for people. Um, I, I don't know if I have an answer for how do we change the image of who we are in this country. When I have seen and read reports, police reports, when they go to a domestic violence call, and before they do anything, the description is black, big, she looked angry. And the reason I'm bringing that up is because this is so much deeper than black girls finding their way. Because it's kind of hard to find your way when the bar has been set. When no matter what we do, we'll, I just, I've come to understand that we have to stop trying to fit where they want us to be it is very simple that I hope your program is real. And I challenge you with saying I hope your program is real because there's so many fake programs out here for black girls. Yeah. Let me teach you how to be a lady. Let me teach you how to assimilate as much as I can to fit their image of you. Yeah. When what we really need to be teaching black girls is really the beauty of who they are. It sounds really simple, but there's something so powerful in that. That the ability to just be who you are and recognize where you come from is real because we we don't always get that. We don't always get what it means to be a black woman for real. And I use that word for real because it, it's, it's a real thing because a lot of times we are challenged by the spaces we are in. You know, how am I gonna get this job? Who's gonna, who's gonna, who's gonna allow me in if I, if I look like this or if I don't talk like this? I have to separate myself. And I strongly am like Darnell, we have to figure out how to stop separating ourselves. See, can't be because, you know, I hate to, make so simplified around hair. And I'm not gonna go in there, but I, I put that out there. You see how people reacted? <laughs> it's so simple, that ain't, that ain't our issue. Stop being fooled by that. You think hair is our issue? Walking down the street as a black woman? When my safety doesn't matter to you, how I'm treated doesn't matter to most people, even amongst ourselves. And so it really becomes us creating a movement. I, I, I love that movement word because I, I know it's real. And I, I keep thinking about how historically that word and what it meant to build movement and have synergy with those who are like us to get to where we have to go was real. And so that's why it, it has to be that that is the way we're moving. That is the way we understand that these are our real issues. These are, this is what we're fighting, not each other, but this system that is in place. And until we get to a point where we're all on the same page, and it sounds hard, but I feel like it can be done. If space is made for that, and if people really commit, and y'all know how it happens, those who are not ready, when we get it done, they'll, we'll bring them along. And so I, I don't know if I answered your question. I just think if you're doing it with black girls, please do it right. Please don't tell them if you act like a lady and don't show your sexual self 
because you know already you know y'all we are not sexual beings black women are not sexy lies but we're not seen that way get them to own who they are and all we were created to be and not that image of who they say we're supposed to be next question Good morning, uh, Reverend Cedric Harmon, co-director of Many Voices, a black church movement for LGBT justice. My question has to do with the statement about toppling the gods. So this presupposes a great deal of authority and agency resident within oneself with Darnell's explication about the ways in which anti-blackness has been internalized. Mm -hmm. What would we draw upon for such agency to topple gods and to reform and to revolutionarily act? I think the first thing is some people got to walk out of their congregations. I mean, there's a lot of LGBT people right now sitting up under people who d d talk about them every Sunday. And so when you are sitting up under someone who says that your very self is not worth anything, you have to ask yourself, why do you continue to sit here and pay your tithes and offerings to somebody who's telling you you ain't worth nothing? So that's the first thing. I mean, you need to be in a place that's going to spiritually nourish you. And, and if you know somebody who is sitting up under something like that, and they tell you, well, I like to sing and I like to choir, then ask them, do they care about their, their soul? Because you can't live under somebody telling you that you shouldn't be there. So that's the first thing. The second thing is we got to keep giving these clowns money. I mean, let's just be real. This is a, this is a financial transaction. And I, I can't say this strongly enough. When Jamal Bryant says these hoes ain't loyal, I'm more like, who you talking about? Right. Who are you talking about? Okay, and, and people call this stuff out on Twitter, but he is going to be invited to everything. When he went to Ferguson, people should have said, we ain't listening to you, right. and walked out the damn door. Why would you listen to Jamal Bryant? Why would you care? And I know people are going to be talking about this. Tweet it out. I don't care. Don't listen to these folks anymore. Stop watching the, them on these TV shows and everything else. Stop giving them authority in your communities. If people want to sit up under this mess, let them, but you don't have to. There are other places to go. You need to support the LGBTQ leaders who are you know, having churches like Yvette Flunder and other people who are supporting that. I'm, I'm thinking about the places you go to divinity school. Some of y'all go to divinity school where they're talking about you. And they, and they don't care anything about you. Why are you going there? Why are you giving them money? You know, this is, it's about consumption. If the first thing you can do is stop this at yourself. Then, then that's a the point. When we begin to say to these gods that you are not gods anymore and take, and take this thing up, and I'll, I'll go one step further. Let me go one step further and say, and say this. It will be very interesting in two weeks to see what the Church of God in Christ is going to do in convocation in St. Louis because they've got multiple levels of things going on. One level is, is that should they be you know, giving this money to Ferguson in the midst of this? I know they can't break those contracts, but they need to take a stand. Secondly, this has been a denomination that has come out against same-sex marriage and homosexuality when they know they got problems in their own denomination right now and they have to pay out a whole bunch of people yes I said it okay so this is these are the ways in which we need to stop this I'm, I'm serious about this when I say toppling down some gods it's like that Old Testament stuff you need to knock that God down knock them down start telling the truth about these people why are people still sitting up in Eddie Long's church come on now what's wrong with them they are bewitched they are beguiled they have lost their minds. Who would sit there? <laughs> Anybody else? How y'all doing? Um, I'm JT Rohn. I'm in the history department here, a uh, PhD candidate. Uh, this was wonderful. Thank y'all um, for this so far. If this is the start, then the rest of the two days is going to be wonderful. Um, I had a question. I'm sensitive as a, someone who's trained as a historian to the ways in which nostalgia plays into this, um, both in terms of the African continent and also in terms of these conversations in our communities, the nostalgia for the lost family, which we all know is a, always bullshit, right? Um, how, how do we, um, this I think is uh, particularly for Dr. Savage um, because you uh, talked about intellectual histories um, I'm wondering what is the role for, uh, what is the role of art, um, what is the role of cultural production, what is the role of those sorts of things in both repurposing nostalgia, because I think nostalgia can have a, a type of political power um, in, in certain moments and in certain inflections, and also 
um, in terms of repurposing the gods, which is the center of this conversation. Thank, uh, thank you for that. And I, of course, it's a really great question that I'm not going to be able to answer. But I'll, uh, I'll say a couple of things. I was, I was reaching for the mic uh, earlier uh, only to make an argument, I guess, as a provincial historian for the place of history and memory as we think about how current day uh, movements are being constructed. And to the extent that we are, I know, extremely excited and moved by what is happening locally, and we've seen that on this panel uh, this morning, we've certainly seen it in Ferguson, but all of the issues that we've been talking about, if, as, a, as a historian, you know, as, as my mother would say, this has been going on for a long time. This did not just start. So these patterns and these debates about respectability, uh, about the difference between uh, figuring out how an individual survives the onslaught of anti-blackness and how you then move towards some sort of sense of the collective. And in thinking about religion, and I think the thing that is always perplexing to me and the struggle is how do you then institutionalize or spread the kind of on the ground work that we are seeing here uh, and how do we support it from wherever we are mm -hmm. and I and I say to people all the time for those of us who are not on the ground in Ferguson at least write a check so somebody who is on the ground can get can get that work done but I do think that there's you know there certainly is a place for history here and the romanticization of an ideal um, that is held there as a, as a place that we want to go back to. Mm -hmm. And you, as you were saying, uh, it was a place that was in many ways uh, as oppressive of the kinds of people that we've been talking about and the kind of people represented here and in this room as, uh, as other institutions that we, um, you know, that we would, would more uh, broadly um, uh, critique. And just to make uh, one final uh, pitch for, uh, for really, really, uh, uh, principled attention to the place of gender mm -hmm. and gender power, power relations and everything that we're talking about here. When we're talking about sexuality uh, and all of the kind of permutations that we've been describing, but the relationships of, the relationship of male power uh, is also, and I don't mean just uh, male power in the white power structure, but the power and tensions between um, the men and women and all the ways that we talk about that, and not just within black churches, but in all the institutions and places where we live and work. And I think that that is also implicated in, in the question that Mignon had earlier mm. about, um, about class and about, and about uh, poor black women. So that's a, that's a roundabout way of saying it's a really great question and to make an argument for the importance of doing the kind of work that you're preparing yourself to do um, that takes us back to a, a much more real understanding of that, you know, that great past that didn't exist in that way or that, that uh, had its own uh, oppressions as, as part of what, uh, what people don't want to recall, mm. okay? Yeah. Thank you. Thank you. Tom Hi, I'm Jonathan Matthias Lassiter. Um, I'm a clinical psychologist and postdoctoral fellow at the Center for HIV Educational Studies and Training. And this question can be for anyone on the panel. Um, is given the deep rootedness of queer stigma and internalized anti-blackness, how does black mental health intersect with black queer sexuality and religion? Thank you. So I think uh, your question has been part of my personal struggle uh, all my life, actually. Um, and religion uh, is in some ways a two-edged sword uh, as it relates to both affirmation and denigration and all the mental health issues that surround that. Uh, so let me just try to say a little bit more. Um, I actually found, through faith, um, the ability to um, imagine myself in a different way, right? Um, even though there is a lot in that faith um, that would tell me that I'm not worth very much, um, 
I found within religion um, the ability to understand um, when I was being mentally and emotionally unhealthy toward myself. Um, and I found within religion the ability to stand against uh, forces that would really destroy me and take me down. That somehow the God of the Bible, not necessarily the God of a particular church or denomination, but that God that came through me through those sacred texts um, helped me to uh, surmount and overcome um, psychological, psychological and emotional challenges that were in my life. Um, but at the same time, I have to recognize um, that religion can easily go the other way. And as you've heard, as we've talked about, as we've seen, as we know through history, whether it's women or gay people or um, anybody else who doesn't fit the perfect paradigm, religion can be used simply to not only uh, keep them uh, in a certain place, but actually to destroy them. Um, and I think that's the struggle that those of us who claim faith as a positive force in our lives, um, that's part of the struggle and the tension that we simply have to endure and engage and, and fight with um, all the time. Um, so I see it as both a positive, uh, I see it as a positive, but I recognize that the very, very negative influence that religion can have on both mental health and sort of healthy psychological yeah, could I add something? Uh, faith is a very important component in our lives because we are beings who have uh, body, spirit, of course, and mind. But uh, I really regard Anselm as a very great helper in this regard. Anselm says, and I found it true that uh, faith seeks understanding. And uh, if you, I find that uh, something does not really fit in understanding God, who is love, I say, no, I think I have to rethink what I really believe in this particular uh, circumstance. So when the faith tries to seek understanding, you are able to deal with this faith even with your mind. Because God has given us a mind. We're reasoning. But often I've found people don't like to use their minds with their faith. Which is wrong. <laughs> because God <laughs> gave us this faculty also. So we need to have our minds when we struggle. In fact, this has helped me as I've been dealing with the human sexuality. Because you can read some texts in the Bible where it says, well, I think Sodom and Gomorrah was this and that. <laughs> and then you find people committing suicide for being what they are, they really know that they are gay, they are lesbians, but you deny them what they are. And you say you base it on certain texts in the Bible. But beyond these texts, I think there is God who is love. And love is the most important thing. So we need to use our reasoning as far as our faith also is concerned. Thank you. Um, because we are about to run out of time, I want to ask the last three people who are in line to come up and give your questions quickly. We'll take them all at once so that we can get them in, okay? So come quickly, please. Um, hello, my name is Nyla Von Molino. I'm a life coach trainee and also public health professional. And I've just been hearing all these questions about counter narratives and how we need to top of the Question, gods. please. Okay. I'm really serious. <laughs> okay, I'm sorry. How do we even create an environment where even people can even think and question? Okay, thank you. Mm -hmm. 
I'm Renee Hill, and my question is, I'm hearing all about these hegemonies, and I'm thinking a lot about Christian hegemony, and how I, I've hoped for this conference that there's more than just Christian voices, but I'm wondering, have any of you had any experiences with um, black people who are, are not Christian and are religious, and um, what kind of work they've been doing? Hi, I'm Kwame Adrian Ocho. I'm actually a pre-doctoral fellow at the University of Virginia. Um, my question is actually on Africa. In what, way, in what ways can we actually dismantle the image of Africa as the heart of darkness or the heart of homophobic darkness? And also, I'm interested in the, the, the extent to which you know, human rights politics has now become currency. So then, what we see is the fact that the West deplores the East to actually sell rights to sexual minorities, whereas they actually ignore the larger neoliberal mm -hmm. plaudits and plunder yeah. that goes on in Africa. So I'll be interested in how you guys can actually um, explain the deal. Okay, thank you. Anybody want to address any of these quickly? I just wanted to offer a resource, and um, that is um, Jackie Alexander's Tobago Center for the Study and Practice of Indigenous Spirituality, of uh, which I'm a board member, is a wonderful resource, and some others in the room are also connected to, but it's a good place for us to turn also. I want to answer the non-Christian question really quickly. Um, I'm actually working with a doctoral student right now at Penn who's working on um, in Vodou in Haiti and Ezeli Dantu and working in the um, immigrant communities. Unfortunately, she's going to be really upset that she wasn't here because I would have shouted her out. But I think one of the ways we can start to do that is to really work on this in our um, places where we, where we teach people because I think this is one of the things that is going to take a lot of time. There's the, definitely a Christian hegemony, especially in America about what we think about African-American people and, and religiosity, and we do need to begin to address that. So um, I can talk to you afterwards about some things I've been thinking about with that. I'd like to give a shout out to Union Seminary and our new interreligious studies program. Uh, that yeah, but we can't plug all that right now. Because <laughs> we're really right out of time. I'm really serious. We're at 1230. So if y'all want to hear about that program, just ask Fred. I want to thank the panelists here. Um, basically, uh, we're going to get a couple of words, so don't get up yet. Yosef Soretta is coming up to say a couple of things and announcements before we go to lunch. This is quick. I just wanted to make this comment real quick. Yeah. The young Sorry, woman yeah. who said about uh, African American women and girls leading in the rates of HIV, I just got a message on Facebook telling me to fix that. And so I have to do so. Actually, it is young African American men who have sex with men who are leading, and we should ask, our, ask ourselves why are we not hearing about that? Thank you, Dion. I'm sorry to mean to cut you off. So, a couple uh, housekeeping matters as well as a uh, question of what's next. Uh, first, the, the hope was for this panel to map out the messiness and the complexity of all that's on the table. I think they've done this brilliantly. Um, and to JT's question and, and Barbara's response, the following panels after lunch attend to the historical narratives and the cultural politics that we inherit to uh, pack out, unpack the specificities of uh, how those conversations are shaped and those frames that we inherit and wrestle and grapple with to undo. Uh, and then this evening, I want to invite you all to uh, First Corinthians, where we'll have a conversation between Yvette Flunder and the singer Donnie, uh, Donnie Johnson, uh, moderated by Guy Ramsey at 7 o'clock tonight. But for now, we have an hour break for lunch. There's plenty of options in the, in the close proximity to where we are. We'll reconvene at 1.30. For presenters and participants, there is a, a lunch available for you downstairs. Uh, as live stream is shutting off, uh, there's questions of where to get it. It's on the conference webpage right beneath the banner. Uh, so when we get back going at 1.30, you can find the link to the live stream there. And thank you all for a great start. See you in a few.